Every Fire Emblem game has a lot of unused content, whether it be music, characters, stats, early graphics, even entire gameplay mechanics. All locked away in the game's data for only hackers to find. And Sacred Stones is no exception to this, though it doesn't have quite as much of significance as a lot of other games. Personally, I find unused content really interesting, as it often gives an indication of early plans that the developers had for the game that would change mid-production. So I'll spend this video discussing some of the unused data found in Sacred Stones, and giving some of my speculation as to what it could mean. Most of this I found through a combination of SerenadesForest.net, The Cutting Room Floor, and the Fire Emblem Wiki. Well, one of the wikis. Before we start, I'll just mention that Sacred Stones contains a lot of data left over from both FE6 and FE7. In fact, it actually has the entire FE6 credits in its data. I don't think I'll be discussing a lot of this in detail, because I feel like none of it was really planned to be in Sacred Stones to begin with. It's all just leftovers from all three GBA games being built off of each other's engines. I'll start with the most interesting, unused characters, and really Sacred Stones only has one. I showed him earlier in the playthrough, the Wyvern Rider Nates. This guy's stats only exist in the beta version, they were removed completely from the final game, but his name still exists in the data. We really know nothing about this guy except that he was a Wyvern Rider. Why he exists though is obvious, I'll get into that shortly. Now there is one more unused name in the game's data, Denny. It appears in between Kalark and Reeve. Whether this implies there was originally another Imperial General who went unused, we'll never know. My personal guess is that he was just a generic boss. There's also this guy, a bandit named... Bandit. Yeah, that's actually his name. This portrait is never used in the final version. I suspect this was originally going to be the prologue boss, before they thought, you know what, let's be original and not have bandits as the prologue boss this time. There's also an unused palette swap of Novala, the chapter 6 boss, though I'm not sure when he'd ever be used. Maybe this guy was Denny. There's also a couple of unused units called Summon and Summoner -n. They accidentally added an extra N to the end of that name, and the localization kept it for some reason. They both appear to be test prototype summoner enemies left over from the beta version, which is interesting because in the final game, you never fight any enemy summoners. Also, they have druid portraits. This is significant because the game actually has unused class portraits for generic enemy versions of Wyvern Knights and Rogues. In the final game, the only enemy Wyvern Knight is Volta, and the only enemy Rogue is... Renek. So you never see generic versions of these classes, but they still have portraits. Summoner, notably, does not have a generic class portrait, which means it's likely they never planned for you to fight enemy summoners. Now, as far as unused characters go, there are a few who do appear in the main story, but have stats in the game's data that you never get to see. One of them is Dara, the old lady of Kea Pelin, who I showed at one point during the main playthrough. She's a druid, a male druid for some reason. Klimt, the head of Carquino's Council of Elders, also has Dara. He's a male bishop. However, the both of them don't have custom base stats and share the exact same growth rates, which would imply neither of them were ever meant to be playable. Their stats probably exist just so they can appear on the map during cutscenes. Now I knew about these two, but one that I actually didn't know about was that of all people, the Fralian Messenger also has unused data, and unlike those two, she does have custom base stats. Huh, maybe she's off having her own adventures separate from the main party. All these characters do have proper profile descriptions programmed in, though you can only see them by hacking since you never get to see their status screens normally. Speaking of profiles you'll never get to see, the Gorgon Egg class has its own fully functional description, which you can't see, and the only reason for that is that you can't view the status screen of a Gorgon Egg. There's also a couple of class descriptions from FE7 classes that are left over in the game's data, but they don't really mean much here. Still, I'm pretty surprised the Fralian Messenger has her own stats programmed in. That's all for unused characters, but there are a few characters who originally had very different roles. I've alluded to many of these during the main playthrough, but the first is Cormag. 
Cormac originally had Joshua's role as the coin-flipping mercenary in Chapter 5. Presumably, he would have been the Ogma archetype of the game and would have been of the mercenary class rather than Wyvern Rider. And Nate would have replaced his role as the Wyvern Rider from Grado that you recruit later on. Now that leads me to think, what would have happened to Joshua in that case? Joshua does have data in the beta version, but as a Swordmaster. So here's my guess as to what his role was. Joshua was still the Prince of Jahana, but he joined later in the game, once you actually reach Jahana and as a pre-promote. He probably wouldn't have had the whole running away from his responsibility character arc that he had in the final version, so I liked the final version of him a lot better. The next case of radically changed characters were Tana and Amelia. Originally, Tana was not the Princess of Fralia, that was Amelia. In some ways, Amelia does look a bit more like she could be Innes' sister than Tana does. But that's not the only major change. Amelia still would have been a trainee, but she would have been a trainee flyer. My guess is that it promoted to either Pegasus Knight or Wyvern Rider, and could end up as either Wyvern Lord, Wyvern Knight, or Falcon Knight. It's a pretty unique concept that in some ways I kind of wish we got. What about Tana though? So if you look at the portraits from the beta version, you can see that Tana is here though she's wearing LaRachel's outfits. LaRachel is also nowhere to be found, although neither is Joshua or Cormag, so you should kind of take this with a grain of salt. Given where Beta Tana is positioned though, it's not hard to imagine that Tana's design was originally used for LaRachel. Odd thing is though, there is a character named Tana in the Beta version's data, and she's a general. So, here's my guess. Tana originally didn't look like she does in the final version at all, and she was a major general of Grado who joined later in the game. Essentially, she and Amelia kind of swap roles. Looking at this set of beta portraits though, you've probably noticed the elephant in the living room. Well, actually three of them. The first is Kyle and Ford. They looked radically different in the beta version. It's almost as if they swapped designs entirely. Also, Ford is a ranger in the beta version, but I feel like that was probably a mistake. The other radically different beta portrait is Naomi, but actually that's Tevi's. This is what Tevi's was originally supposed to look like. Somewhere during development, she got a complete redesign, and her original design was palette swapped and given to Naomi. Also, Naomi still existed in the beta version, and her name was Mary, so I'm guessing they didn't have a portrait for her at this point, and they had to repurpose someone else's at the last minute. Anyway, from the look of it here, it seems like Beta Tethys would have been Ewan's twin rather than older sister. I feel like they probably changed this because Beta Tethys looked a bit too young to be a provocative dancer. The beta version also has evidence that Ephraim's name was originally supposed to be something like Isaac or some variant on Isaac, but there's evidence this was scrapped pretty early. With that out of the way, next on the agenda is unused items, and there's actually quite a lot of them in this game. In the English version, all of these items were renamed DUMMY in all capital letters. But looking at their icons and stats, it's pretty obvious what some of these are. Mainly leftovers from FE7. This first unused sword is very obviously Lin's Manai Katai. It has the exact same stats, and it's coded to be a pref weapon, but nobody in Sacred Stones can use it. Presumably, it's still Lin only, but Lin not being in Sacred Stones, it's unusable by anyone. The next one is Four Blaze. It's pretty obviously Four Blaze, and here it's actually an S rank animatone, not locked to Arthos. The one below it looks like Luce, the S rank light spell from FE7, but it's only a B rank here. More leftovers from FE7, we have the Mine and the Light Rune. Both of these items are known for being fully functional if you hack them into the game. Also, a little known fact about the Mine item. Assassins, well technically it's coded to be an effect of the silencer skill, but only assassins have that. Assassins can actually pick up mines and put them in their inventory. There's text in the game for this that simply says, recovered mine, but because they remove mines, you'll never see that without hacking. There's also another unused item here, a bag of gold. It does absolutely nothing, but I'm guessing that this is what monsters originally dropped, rather than giving you gold directly. They drop gold bags worth various amounts that you'd have to sell, much like the random enemies do in Awakening. 
The developers probably thought that simply having them drop gold directly would be more convenient. Also, more fully functional leftovers from FE7. Here's the Heaven Seal, and it still promotes Lords, so Erica and Ephraim can use it. There are also reports of the Earth Seal existing as well, and it works the exact same way the Master Seal does. Now here are some very strange items. The first of these is a Vulnerary with 60 uses. It works perfectly fine. My guess is this was just a debug item to make getting through the game easier for testers. Though I seem to remember one of the earlier GBA games had a download event for a 60 use vulnerability, maybe it's a leftover from that. Now what's really weird is two other items, both named vulnerary, that have 60 uses, but don't do anything. They also have weird music notes as their icons. Your guess is as good as mine as to what the heck these are. Then there's this item that's apparently quite famous around the community of this game, the Stone Shard. This seems to be a very early version of monster weapons. Monsters that don't use normal weapons, like Revenants, Entombed, or Bales, can use this as an attacking weapon. It's been reported that there are some early screenshots of this game that show monsters fighting with Stone Shards. The next unused item here is actually more interesting though. This one has a proper localized name, a la Calibre, though most fans refer to it as Air Calibre. It's a B-ranked tome that's wind-based and thus deals bonus damage against flyers. So kind of like an Excalibur light. The spell originally appeared in FE6 Binding Blade, and it has the exact same stats here as it did back there. But in this game, for some reason, they decided not to implement it. It works perfectly fine when hacked in, with two exceptions. One, it has a killer ballista icon, and two, the music cuts out while its animation is playing. Maybe they glitched up the spell animation somehow, and decided to scrap the spell entirely and pretend it never happened. We've done unused characters, unused items, now let's go into unused graphics. A lot of different gender variants of classes that you don't get those genders of still have graphics in the game's data, like female shamans and druids. Female heroes also have map sprites. There's also this weird glitchy female mercenary map sprite that's existed ever since Binding Blade, but's never actually been used properly. Along with what appears to be an early version of the Wyvern Knight map sprite. There are also, and this I find really strange, fully functional battle animations for male archers, not female archers, not snipers, only male archers, using ballistas. The only way to see these is to hack a ballista weapon directly into a male archer's inventory. It's weird because FE6 Binding Blade always had battle animations like this for ballistas. But both FE7 and 8 restrict ballistas to map animations only. I'm not really sure why this is. There's also a couple of unused cutscene graphics for the names of locations on the world map. I apologize if these are very hard to see, this is just what they look like in the game's data. There's one of these for Kea Pelin, and one that simply lists question mark, but the area of the map that it's highlighting corresponds to Darkling Woods. Presumably, these two locations would have been included in the opening storyline about the history of all the country's nations. There are also a few full gameplay mechanics that exist in the game's data but are never used. All of the weather conditions from FE7 exist and are fully functional. Here's an example of the prologue map hacked to have rain, and it does slow down Seth's movement like you'd expect. Something I find kind of amusing is the fire background effect that's used in a few cutscenes in FE7, as well as one side quest map in FE6, is technically considered a weather, and thus it's included here. All of Ninian's Dancer Ring stat buffs are fully coded into the game. In fact, the rings themselves still exist in the game's data, and they still work when used by dancers. They don't appear to have been fully translated though, because you can still see some Japanese on loot status screen here. That's Japanese for protect. Speaking of status conditions, there's a status condition called Seek that exists in the game's data, but it has a blank description and does nothing. Maybe this is a status that Revenants and Entombed could have inflicted? I don't know what it would have done though. There's also an unused Armor Knight Triangle attack. If you've played FE6, you'll know there was one of those in that game, and it seems like its animations are reused here. This is fully functional, provided that you hack three characters into being armor knights or generals, and set an ability of theirs to triangle attack. 
given that you don't get three armor knights in the final game, at least not during the main story, so you wouldn't be able to use it anyway, but it's kind of weird this still exists. Next, a few hints at possible unused maps. Among the map names, Tower of Valny 9 and Tower of Valny 10 are listed. Yep, the tower was originally going to be even longer. The same length as the Lagdo Ruins, in fact, but they must have scrapped two of the maps sometime during development. There are two Tower of Valny maps that appear in the beta version that don't match up with any of the ones in the final version, so it's possible these were the two scrap ones. I'm guessing they would have actually gone earlier, and the later two maps would have still been the same as they are in the final version, because these ones don't look all that elaborate. They wouldn't really make sense as the last two. I also mentioned this during the main playthrough, but in the game's data, Chapter 11 on both routes, so Creeping Darkness on Erika's and Phantom Ship on Ephraim's, are listed at the very end of the maps, and both maps aren't in the beta version at all. They also both lack world map locations. This would imply these two maps were last minute additions to the game. Interestingly enough though, the map for Erika's Chapter 11 was originally supposed to be Chapter 6. Instead of Aldous Plains, Chapter 6 would have taken place at a location called Fort Zerai. The beta version's world map even reflects this. There's a fort in between Seraphu and Renval. Don't mind the obvious copy-pasted castles, they probably hadn't finished the graphics at the time. Chapter 6 was actually the most radically changed from a story perspective too. Now there's not much in this game to suggest of different unused story concepts. But Chapter 6 had a lot. So in both versions, the boss of the chapter, Novala, takes some civilians hostage and demands Erika hand over her bracelet in exchange for their safety. In the final version, he sends them to be devoured by a giant spider and you're able to rescue them. In the original version of the story, they weren't so lucky. Erika would have handed over her bracelets, only for Novala to murder them anyway. The end of the chapter also would have been different. Soleil, a character who doesn't appear in the final version for a lot longer, would have shown up and killed Novala with a scripted critical. This might mean that Soleil had a slightly bigger role in the original planned story. The only other story difference occurred in Chapter 8, the boss of that chapter was originally supposed to be much more important. Now, he doesn't have a proper portrait here, but if you can read the dialogue, he's introducing himself as Jude Rupert, one of Grado's seven, yes, seven Imperial Generals. So you originally ended the first act of the game by fighting one of Grado's actual Imperial Generals, rather than an ambitious underling who wants to be a general. I really wish they'd still gone with this, because I felt it would have been a much more climactic finale to the first part of the game. Even in the final version, Tirado still has the powerful faux boss theme, which is normally reserved for the Imperial Generals. Unfortunately, in the beta version, all story cutscenes stop after this point, so it's impossible to know whether anything later on would have been different to the final plotline. So that's everything I want to talk about when it comes to unused content. You might be wondering whether there's any unused music in this game. Actually, no. Bizarrely enough, Sacred Stones does not have unused music. I guess the soundtrack is already perfect enough as is. But one more thing that I want to talk about before I end this video. Something that's not technically unused, but to English speakers it pretty much is. And these days, to anyone in the world it is. Did you know that Sacred Stones kind of has DLC? There are five items that are coded into the game, but can only be obtained officially via a download event at Jump Festa 2004. Naturally only Japan got this, and I believe they only ever got this event once, so these items are very rare even among Japanese copies. Four of these are weapons. They're all basically iron weapons with five extra critical and an effectiveness bonus against monsters. They are the Shadow Killer, the Bright Lance, the Fiend Cleaver, and the Beacon Bow. All of them pretty awesome names. These weapons would be more useful earlier than later in the game because, well, then you have the Sacred Twins. The last of these quasi-DLC items, though, is one of the most interesting by far, as it's an effect that hasn't really been used in many Fire Emblem games. This is the Juna Fruit. It only works on characters level 9 or above, 
and it lowers their level by 1 to 5 while still keeping their stats the same, letting you level up more than you would otherwise be able to. A pretty cool effect, but sadly locked behind an event that was only ever released in Japan and only for a very short amount of time. Oh well, at least it's better than, I don't know, not getting two entire DLC chapters, but that's another issue entirely. So that's the end of my discussion of Sacred Stones' unused contents. There turned out to be a bit more to talk about than I thought. Someday I might like to try recording footage from the beta version itself, because there's a lot of interesting stuff to test out there. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.